Listener-supported St. Gabriel Catholic Radio AM820 brings you Foundations in Faith. Join Monsignor Frank Lane as he offers insights into the readings heard at Mass. And now, Foundations in Faith with Monsignor Frank Lane. This is Father Frank Lane, and we're continuing our program, uh, Foundations in Faith. Today, what we're going to do is look at the Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter, and it's the famous story of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. There's all sorts of, there's all sorts of, of uh, teaching in this particular gospel. And it has to do both with biblical history, but also with the saving presence of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ as word, as sacrament, and so forth. So it's a pretty important text for us to to uh, begin to deal with. In the, in the liturgical life of the church, it's a cycle, a reading, and so it's used in, in conjunction with the, the RCIA. So what we have then is, it says, <clears throat> it says in the Gospel, Jesus came to us to a Samaritan town called Sichar, near the land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well is there. And Jesus, tired from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, What? You are a Jew, and you ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? Jews, in fact, do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus replied, Okay. So the first thing is, there's all sorts of little twists in the story so far. It's normal, it was normal for the Jews. It was about a three-day journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the shortest way was to go through Samaria. But since there was such hard feelings between the Samaritans and the Jews, the Jews would usually take the extra time and bypass Samaria so that they didn't have to mingle or mix with the people there. So by the very fact that Jesus is going through Samaria, the story is set up to be a little bit different. And as he's going along, he stops by the well, Jacob's well, and uh, his disciples go off into the nearest town to get provisions for this journey, um, this three-day journey. I'm not sure exactly how it is in, in Israel, but certainly in most um, countries where there is large expanses of land and small villages and so forth, what you find is that the villages are situated around 20 miles apart, actually, which is a good long day's walk. And so what they, they have to stop when they get to a place, and they have to then go out and begin to get the provisions that they need for that evening and for whatever they're going to take with them in the morning. So this is what's happened when a woman comes to the well, a Samaritan woman comes to the well to, to, uh, to get water from the well. Jesus does not have a bucket to go down into the well, and so he says to the woman, um, give me a drink, oh, give me a drink. And, uh, and she says to him, but you're a Jew and you're asking me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water? because the Jews and the Samaritans don't have anything to do with each other. So Jesus is beginning now to break some taboos, actually. Um, Not the law, but the taboos that are sometimes associated with the law. And one of those taboos, first of all, was for a man, a rabbi, to, to speak to a woman in public. Um, even the rabbi's wives were not able to be spoken to in public. So this is the breaking of all sorts of protocol and all sorts of taboos. And, uh, and then not only is he speaking with her, but he's asking her a favor, which means that he's turning to someone who he shouldn't even be talking to at all, both because she is a woman and because she is a Samaritan, and simply asking a simple question just for some water. Now, I think this is important. This is an important incident of this. You know, in some of the modern theological discussions, um, and and I, I think we've gotten beyond this particular one, but for a long time it was uh, people said, well, you know, we can't ordain women because um, that you say we can't ordain women 
because Jesus didn't ordain women, but Jesus was confined and constricted by the uh, social customs of his age. And so it just would have been culturally insensitive and culturally kind of impossible for him to include women in the priesthood from the earliest days. I think this is just an example where that kind of argument really isn't substantial at all. Um, Jesus broke whatever taboos he felt he felt like breaking and uh, broke whatever taboos he felt you know, um, would would help to communicate um, the word that he was proclaiming. And so here was a very, very strong taboo, not something, again, against the law, but a strong taboo. He's talking privately to a strange woman, and he's doing so out in the open. And not only is he doing that, not only is she a woman, she's a Samaritan, and not only that, but he's asking her for a favor. All of those things for the Hebrew reader of this text would be kind of surprising and uh, would kind of be, well, you know, we really don't do that sort of thing. How can he possibly be doing it? So I think that in this we see, um, and, and we have to make a distinction too between the law, um, the Torah, which Jesus did observe and the taboos of the society, which he simply ignored, um, when it was useful to ignore them. And I think that we ourselves, having lost a sense of a law that is separate from our current um, fanatical obsession, um, that it, it really becomes... Um, we, we really can't make that kind of a distinction between laws and taboos. And um, so we try to impose taboos through the politically correct mantle that's thrown over just about everything, um, but they're not deep-seated, they're not historical, they're, they're whimsical. And uh, as being whimsical, they're unsubstantial. But here, this is a long-standing um, taboo that they have, a long-standing tradition, because Samaria and uh, Israel and, and Judah had split many, many, many centuries before the coming of Jesus. So it was a deep-rooted hostility and animosity between the two peoples, and the lack of communication with them was seen as being normative and acceptable. So that's one thing as we look at this. But that's not the main point of the story, because the story goes on then after... Um, she asks Jesus, why are you asking me and a Samaritan um, why, for, for this kind of for a favor? And he said, if you only knew what God is offering, and what it is that he's saying to you, give me a drink, would not have been the one to ask. You would not have been the one to ask, and he would have given you living water. In other words, Jesus now begins a discourse basically, on himself as the source of life. And in John's Gospel, this is obviously a reference to baptism. And it's interesting, too, because historically, when Christianity began to spread within the present Holy Land, um, the Samaritans enthusiastically accepted it. So we can say, in a sense, that Jesus goes to a place. He goes to a place that has turned against, in a sense, the law of Israel that has embedded itself for centuries in a culture somewhat alien and somewhat foreign to the religion of the covenant. And yet, at the same time, they are the ones most responsive when the word of God comes, when the living waters actually do flow among their people and through their people. We ask ourselves, well, what, what is that all about? And part of it is, part of it is this. One of the things that comes up continually in the Gospels, and something that we really have to think about, is the danger of religion. Um, secular society loves to talk about that 
and say, oh, well, religion is responsible for all of the conflict and so on and so forth, which is purely an ignorant statement, very honestly. But the fact that religion can become a pathological obsession, obsession um, in the book, The Dialectics of Secularization, Benedict XVI even says that, that while we can have a pathology of religion, we also can have a pathology of reason. In other words, we can take both things and use them for things for what they are not. And one of the conflicts that Jesus has in the Gospels, one of the conflicts that he has with the Pharisees, is interesting because not all the Pharisees were actually bad people or anything like that. In fact, as Jesus himself was considered to be a Pharisee by many. Um, Basically, though, he singles out those people. And in John's Gospel, they're singled out, they're called the Jews, which has always been kind of a, a problem and kind of a a sense of, uh, you know, an, an unjust kind of racial slur of some kind. But it was the language of the day, and, and the Jews were the ones um, that who bore that title in a pejorative sort of way in the Gospels, were the ones basically who had taken charge of the form of religious life in Israel, while themselves being partisans of a political movement primarily and a political movement that that enabled them to derive benefits from a relationship with the occupying forces of the Roman army. And so this is the thing that Jesus confronts, this external religion. We certainly know that today, that there's all sorts of people who go around saying, I'm Catholic, I'm Catholic, I'm Catholic, but are much more devoted to some partisan political situation than than they are to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So this is not an unusual phenomenon. It's It's something that we have today. Our government is full of these people. And, uh, and they are the Pharisees of the modern age. And, um, and these are the ones that Jesus confronts. And these are the ones that Jesus says, you have to be liberated from this prison of politics and be able to open your heart then instead to the person of Jesus Christ. And that kind of interior water, that interior law, which flows from faith and is not able to be manipulated in the public arena by opportunists and by by those who value the secular state, the civil state, more than they do um, the people of God, more than they do the church of Jesus Christ. So this is what he's confronting. Well, here in John's Gospel, something is happening. The people who have shed this kind of prison, but in doing so have moved beyond um, fidelity to the God of the covenant, are the ones who are most open and most responsive to the living water, to the word of Jesus Christ. And it is something that we've encountered oftentimes in the gospel, that it is, it is not the public, um, partisan, political believer who is open to God's word at all. It is instead the people who have struggled in their lives, struggled authentically and honestly with the faith. And so while the Samaritans have struggled with the covenant of Israel and come up outside of it, they therefore, in this lack and in this need, they are more vulnerable and more open to God's word. And I think that, you know, the Pharisees, having locked themselves into their political religion, are not in any way vulnerable or open to the word of God, to the presence of God. They, in fact, know it all. And so I I think that this becomes a paradigm, a model for us as we look at the situation in the modern world and not just in biblical times. The other thing that begins to happen is Jesus enters into a discussion with this Samaritan woman about the water that he asks for. And she says to him, you don't even have a bucket. And uh, and the well is deep. Could you get, where could you get living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself with his sons and his cattle? And Jesus replied, whoever drinks this water will get thirsty again. 
But whoever drinks the water that I shall give will never be thirsty again. The water that I shall give will turn into a spring inside of him, welling up to eternal life. So Jesus is now using an ordinary reality to express an extraordinary reality. And that's pretty much, in many ways, a style that he has. He uses parables and he uses images. The mustard seed, for instance, is one that comes immediately to mind. He uses material objects in order to reveal the divine presence and the divine working in the world. And it's very, very interesting in all of this because this model of explanation, this model of experiencing the Christ, is the very same model that the Church has adapted in the whole sacramental system that it is the communication through the ordinary material signs of the divine, the infinite reality that exists within, within the faith, within the church. And that, um, that we ourselves then, our sacramental system is based very firmly on the technique, the method, and the message of Jesus in the Gospels. It is not something that intrudes from the outside, and it is not something that is uh, constructed um, by, um, by partisan proselytizers of the early centuries of the Church. It is a gospel reality and a gospel method that, that comes to us. And in this gospel reality, this gospel method that comes to us, it is something that therefore flows through history, through time, through revelation into the lives and the hearts of people. As we go to our sacramental system, we find that there was always at least words involved, but not only words but also we use water, we use oil, we use all of those kinds, we use laying on of hands, we use physical signs and physical realities um, in, in order to express a divine presence, a transcendent presence. So when Jesus is turning this request for water at the well into um, an excursus really on baptism and on him as the source of himself, as the source of baptism, the woman says to him, Sir, Um, Give me some of that water so that I will never get thirsty and never have to come here again to draw water. So she, in a way, misunderstands what he's saying. He's saying that somehow or other there is a constant stream that would overcome the need to walk up to the well and haul the water and so forth. And she says, I I want some of that. And now Jesus probes deeper into her life and shows her in a way that he points out to her or lets her point out for herself her disorderly way of life that would be in many ways an impediment to the reception of the living water. And so it's like in our own lives, it is our own sinfulness, the disorderliness of our own life, which makes us resistant to the effect and the grace of the sacraments. And so he says to her, go and call your husband and come back here. And the woman, we can imagine, would hesitate and say, well, I I don't have a husband. And he said to her, you are right, I have no husband. For although you have had five, the one you now have is not your husband. So that what he's saying is, first of all, that she's living with a man after who she's not married to, after she has been married five times. We know, for instance, even in the Law of Moses, that that was in some ways an outrageous situation for a woman to find herself in, even though a writ of divorce was permitted in those days. But the man gave the writ of divorce, not the woman. So if she had been divorced by five men, that tells you something about the kind of person maybe she was. Um, She certainly was not compliant, and she certainly um, obviously was not all that easy to get along with. And um, and also she had few scruples about her, about her her life, her body, and so forth. So when Jesus says that, then something else um, he emerges from this too, that he's implying that there is some kind of blockage 
to the reception of living water. And, uh, but the woman has to acknowledge and to confess that which is disorderly in her life. The sign of reconciliation is based on the facticity, based on the reality of the woman's life. And so he offers her this living water, and she says, well, give me some. And then he says, well, first of all, in a way, and and this is almost a liturgical thing, in a way, tell me your sins. And so this is exactly what he says when he says, go and get your husband. So she admits to this very disorderly life. And, um, and so he acknowledges her sins. And then, um, then she says to him, once she has confessed, she says to him, I see you are a prophet because you, you knew ahead of time what I was like. And yet, nevertheless, you stopped and talked to me, you asked me for water, you have promised me this living water. Unworthy as I am, and I now have confessed to you what that unworthiness, much of that worthiness is all about, um, yet you, you know what that is, so you must be a prophet. And so there's the first step in her conversion, and in the conversion of her village, is that that there is an acknowledgement of sin. And then it's interesting because it goes from personal sin to the, per, to the sin of the people. And it says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain while you say that Jerusalem is the only place where one ought to worship. And so she then draws into her own personal confession actually the confession of the Samaritan people, that they have disagreed with the revelation of Moses, with the revelation of the covenant. And so in doing so, there comes together then not only this personal sense of openness to the word of God, but the corporate and the communal sense of the openness to the word of God. And when Jesus says all this, she goes back to her village. And going back to the village, she says, I have seen the prophet, I, in, in the sense of the, the Messiah, that is the Christ. And, uh, and so the people then come and they say, um, well, you know, let us come also, and uh, let let us come also, and and pay pay him homage, so that while this is going on, then we have here a story of reconciliation of sacramental grace through the presence of the person of Jesus. He initiates through an ordinary encounter, a conversation. The conversation which leads to a revelation of who he is, then a a call for reconciliation, for repentance, for confession of sin, which the woman does on her own part personally, but also does then in the name of her community by talking about the the living water and by by talking about or, or by talking about her husband's and the man she's cohabitating with at the present time. And it's part of a, a Semitic trait. Um, you know, when, when you want to emphasize something, there are no comparatives or superlatives in the Hebrew language, so you kind of exaggerate. So we might well say that this is a Johanna an exaggeration, in a sense, to show the disorderliness of her life, whether she actually had five husbands or whether that was an exaggeration of the number she had in order to show the seriousness of her condition, of her situation. Whichever the case may be, what the Gospel is saying that her situation was serious and that uh, it is to the serious situation that Jesus casually introduces himself and then begins the formal, in a way, what we would call true catechesis of all this that that is going on. At this point, however, after she had gone back to the village, and Jesus says to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You, what you, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation comes from the Jews. He's saying, you know, you're, you're worshiping in a sense a false god because the, god, the one God is the God who has revealed himself to Israel. And this is something we get into. We get into an incredible kind of religious relativism in our society, too, where, you know, Jesus becomes, in a sense, like one of the many gods in the pantheon of modern gods. We do this 
all the time. And we don't do it consciously. We don't say that we're doing it, but we do it. Um, when we say, well, you know, as long as they believe in a God, fine. Um, but what kind of God do they believe in? You have some very angry, harsh gods. Um, Allah is not uh, a, a, a very compassionate, uh, paternal figure at all. Um, and And you have all sorts of different gods, and you have people projecting um, images and identities and, and definitions of gods all over the world. And you say, oh, well, you know, that's fine. Let's just maybe, as long as they follow their God and so forth. What does this do to the Lord God of creation? What does this do to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? What does this do to Jesus as the Messiah? It puts them on a plane with all of the other humanly created gods, and it doesn't distinguish them. That's what a pantheon is. It's, it's a, a place of pan-gods. It's a place where many gods are represented in worship. And, uh, and that this is something the Romans used to do quite often. They would bring images of the foreign gods back with them and place them, you know, among the Roman gods and so forth. There's a way kind of, 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 uh, um, in incorporating, um, the, the conquered territories into, into the empire itself. And so you could go in and you could find the images then of the many gods. And the gods, uh, each god becomes one god among many. We tend to do that all the time. We tend to put Jesus in a pantheon of gods instead of saying, He is the Lord. He is the Son of the Father. He is of the Trinity. He is the One. And that there is no other. And that when we lose this sense of the centrality of Jesus in the whole cosmic order, we lose the sense of our faith completely. Because what we end up with is some kind of syncretistic faith that, um, that really has very little to do with anything in Revelation. And to that, Jesus says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation comes from the Jews. And he's saying, it is therefore from the God of Israel that salvation comes to the world. And anyone who worships a God who is not that God worships what they do not know. And they do not know it because it does not exist. It is not real. But then he moves on. And he says, but the hour will come, in fact, it is already here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. That is the kind of worshiper the Father wants. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. And so he's saying it's going to move beyond the confines of the geographical, the confines of the geopolitical, and it's going to become, therefore, something that is open to the whole spirit of humanity, that the time will come when God will be acknowledged from all peoples, from within, and not through some kind of, of cultural construct, some kind of geopolitical um, identification. This was something, of course, that the Hebrews were very, very careful about and, and, and very, very adamant about, is that, you know, the God of Israel was the God of Israel, and that that was um, as it was to be. So well, there's much more to the story. There's much more. But for now, let us reflect just upon these things that we have discussed the role of Jesus in breaking taboos, the way that Jesus reveals, the process of acceptance of that revelation, the acknowledgement, the confession of sins, and the bestowing of the word that turns the hearts of many. And let us pray that that become the paradigm also of the modern church. Foundations in Faith is a production of listener-supported St. Gabriel Catholic Radio AM820. Archives of Foundations in Faith are available at stgabrielradio.com. Sanctity.